So Maker Speedrun is all about being able to design, build, manufacture and sell a product as quickly as possible. Hi, this video is being sponsored by JLC PCB. Not only did they produce all the PCBs in this video, but they sourced almost all the components, apart from a couple that weren't in stock. JLC PCB can manufacture prototype PCBs from one to six layers with track widths down to 3.5 mil. They also support pretty much everything you can throw at them. So check the description below for a list of their capabilities. For only two bucks, you can get 10 PCBs manufactured within 48 hours. That's pretty cool. Day six. So I'm taking a trip up to a mate of mine uh, who runs Keen Electronics. Uh, you would have met him before. So Keen has got a pick and place machine and all the other equipment to uh, assemble PCBs. So Keen's office is up in the bush, uh, up at Mount Kringai, sort of uh, redneck territory. <laughs> So the first thing I normally do is go through the BOM or Bill of Materials and label each of the packets with the component name. Of course this method only really works if you are going to use all the components for one PCB. Once everything is labelled, onto the stencil machine. The frame stencil is secured to the arm and allows you to apply solder paste accurately. There are several arms that can be adjusted to hold the PCB secure using holes in the panelization edge strip and pegs to keep the PCB flat and stop it from bending when applying paste. Pull the arms outwards as you tighten them so that the PCB is held in securely. Once you've secured the PCB there are three fine adjustments that you can use to line up the stencil with the PCB SMD pads. Then use a screeder with paste evenly spread along one edge and slowly drag it over the stencil. You should only make one pass, otherwise it'll get pretty messy. So it's very important to make sure that you are clean off the tools of solder paste, otherwise people like Keen get very grumpy. Very grumpy. Next on to manually loading components. I didn't use the pick and place machine because I still wasn't 100% sure this design would work and a pick and place machine takes a while to set up. Next on to reflow soldering. So that's pretty quick. Uh, it didn't actually take uh, too long to do. It's now roughly about six o'clock. Um, so it's a bit of chatting with uh, Keen and so forth. I've managed to get three boards completely soldered up. Of course, if I was using the pick and place, uh, it would take a lot longer to set up, but then I'd be able to churn the boards out uh, a lot quicker. I'm now I'm gonna take the, these three boards home and uh, fix up some of the uh, issues that I see on it. There's actually not too many issues, which is pretty good. If I can actually get these three boards uh, up and running and they're actually working properly, I can put it up on Tindy and I'll be able to quite easily make the one week turnaround. Okay, it looks, uh, looks pretty decent. There's a couple of errors uh, that I can see. Um, there's parts that haven't been uh, soldered properly. Uh, I think down here, yeah, there's a couple of bits that haven't been soldered properly, uh, but I'll just work on it and fix them up. So it looks like the uh, semis are pretty well uh, soldered in. There's a couple of mistakes. So these uh, leadless packages can be a bit of a bugger sometimes, but uh, they're actually 
pretty well sold it up. Overall, I think this is pretty decent considering it was a complete rush job. Edges of the board tend to uh, suffer the most in terms of uh, reflow. Okay, so now I'm just going to check for some basic shorts to see if, uh, if everything's all connected up or if things are connected that shouldn't be connected. So it's open circuit, which is always nice. So I'm just checking the uh, power and ground just to make sure there's no short circuit across the power and ground. It's looking good so far. I think we should uh, power it up now. So I'm going to uh, limit uh, the current, I'm going to crank it right down to probably about uh, 300 milliamps, maybe 200 milliamps, because I don't really want uh, this thing to completely die. Nice, we're getting a blue LED, which is uh, the power LED, and let's just check the voltage, and we're getting a steady 5.12 volts. So that one's all right. 5.07 volts which is pretty good and 5.09 volts so that's pretty good all three are functioning at least uh, they're providing uh, 5 volts out I just need to check the uh, charging capability and also just double check the waveform to make sure I got a nice clean signal Okay, so I've got a uh, 0.1 millivolt uh, sawtooth ripple on the output of the uh, supply. And this was largely because I had to change one of the output capacitors from 100 microfarads to uh, 74 microfarads, I think it was. If I had actually used 100 microfarads, then uh, that would probably disappear. I don't think it's too bad. So I've got a 1.2 amp hour LiPo battery um, and Let's see if it actually, nice. It actually uh, powers up the uh, LED at least. Uh, let's see how it goes uh, charging the battery because I think it's a little bit drained to this battery. Okay, so theoretically uh, this charge, I've got the power connected up, uh, even with the jumper connected and no power coming out here, the battery should be charging. The charge light should actually be glowing. So that's really weird. Uh, let's have a look at the PCB and see why. Uh, from ground to this. Oh, I'm actually getting one volt, which is strange. And I'm getting on the other side of the LED, I'm getting 0.1. It's floating. That's really weird. I uh, need to look at the PCB and see what's going on. Okay, so this is weird. Uh, for some reason, the other side of the resistor isn't connected to uh, 5 volts, uh, which is supposed to be. It's just completely empty. I must have uh, not connected it up on the uh, schematic. Let's look at the schematic. Okay, so Doofus here uh, didn't check the uh, nets on the schematic. Uh, and if you look over here, there's this one, which says plus 5 volts and this one says 5.0 volts. So they're not the same net. In fact, if I do a show, you'll see that they're actually very different. It basically means that it's a floating net and nothing's connected to it. So, bodge wire time. So that should do it. Now let's power it up and see if the LED glows. And the green LED is glowing because the battery is charging. The battery charge indicator LED actually is fed into the Pi and uh, that will actually register either a high or a low depending on if the uh, battery is being charged or not. So this signal comes directly from here, goes, passes through the LED and then into the Pi. It's a five volt signal. Fortunately, the Pi can handle five volt logic levels. So that's all working really well. Let's uh, chuck on a Pi and see if we can get uh, some LEDs uh, displaying.
So what I've done is I've built a an LED panel and I'm actually going to be using this as a lighting array. Uh, something I'll have for my new studio that'll sit above my desk and I'll be able to change the color temperature and all sorts of things. Um, so I just built this out of an LED strip, um, cut up the LED strip and of course I connected the data in and data out on all the LED strips and uh, powered everything from one side. Uh, so that actually works quite well. And the whole thing is powered using a Pi strip, Pi Zero W and my custom PCB. Let's fire it up and see what it looks like. So there you go, it actually looks pretty good. And uh, I'll be able to increase the brightness, probably not to 100%. I've only got a fairly small um, LiPo battery, so it doesn't really support uh, a lot of LEDs at high brightness. Um, but that's pretty good. So if you're watching fairly carefully, you would have picked up a number of mistakes I made. Firstly, not using a buffer between the WS2812 LED strip and the Pi. Not all strips can work properly with 3.3 volt logic. So a simple BSS138 will provide the necessary logic level conversion. Uh, secondly, not all LED strips are 5 volts, but more often you will see 12 volt LED strips. So I'll need to modify the LiPo charging circuitry to handle up to 15 volts at least. Thirdly, there's the old bodge wire. Yeah, mistakes can happen. One of the important things to check for is floating nets, or devices that aren't connected to anything. Just goes to show that if you skip a part of your process, you end up paying for it. Fourthly, I need to break out more GPIOs off the Pi. I added a small header that can select one of three GPIOs to drive the LED strip, but it's a shame I didn't break out more of the Pi GPIOs. I'll definitely be fixing those in the next revision of this board, so stay tuned for that. So did I actually manage to design, manufacture, build and put up for sale on Tindy? Apart from that small experience with storms in the middle, I actually did and you can pick up one of these three Pi strips on my Tindy store. So that's about it. Thanks for watching and see you next week. This is Keen being very grumpy. <laughs> do a grumpy face. I don't know how to do a grumpy face. Focus! Okay, he does actually get quite grumpy. No, I don't. <laughs> he does.